secularism, constitutionalism, and the judiciary. And the first panelist is Lucia Corso. Lucia is professor in philosophy of law at the Core University of Ena, Sicily. She is also a member of the Popcorn Network. Uh, Lucia, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you, Akritas. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for this wonderful conference. And um, I will just go immediately to my paper because the, the time is not. Um, I would like to start with the premises because when I started approaching populism, I didn't start it with the approach of the political scientist. Actually, I started populism through constitutional theory. St studying, I was studying in the US at that time, and they always um, came into this populist constitutionalism. And, and, and I was in some way thrilled about the idea that uh, popular sovereignty could uh, be again uh, um, valued, while uh, what I saw around in the European context, um, the, 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 the dominance of legal constitutes constitutionalism was uh, pretty much everywhere. So I was a little bothered about this uh, kind of, uh, um, uh, I don't know, snobbish approach against any form of populism. However, having lived for more than two years under a populist government in Italy, I would say that uh, I wouldn't say that I completely changed my mind, but uh, I have focused on another aspect of populism, which was less clear to me uh, when I started, uh, which is not really the hyper-politicization of issues that were once a matter of constitutional scholar, but it's mostly the anti-political stance of populist uh, politics, which seems a paradox, but we all speak about paradox. So my lessons today, my, my, my speech today, is going to focus on that. Uh, what is the relationship between anti-politics, populism, and judiciary power? Because uh, this relationship may seem to contrast, contrast with the conventional view that sees uh, uh, populism as a strategy which usually targets judiciary power. This is true sometimes, for instance, in Hungary, Poland, Turkey, with Trump a little bit. But for instance, this is not at all the case of Italy. So I will focus on, uh, um, on these three poles, um, anti-populism, uh, anti-politics, populism and the judiciary. And um, I will start re re recalling that in the 1950s, the historian Richard Hofstetter identified vigilantism and moralism and suspiciousness as recurrent features of the populist spirit. And uh, the historian who never uh, hid his contempt for populism explained the ideological bond between populist political actors and magistrates and judges and prosecutors and he said, with the resentful trait of the first and the suspiciousness of the latter. More recently, the French historian, which was mentioned before, Pierre Rosamond Lon, has argued that populism has its roots also in the judicialization of politics. And he writes, corrosively enlarging the idea of the citizen judge, populism embraces the fantasy of replacing politics with law. Not only is the very essence of power ridiculed and criminalized so that all civic activity is reduced to mudslinging, but criminal accountability replaces the political. Hence, the strong populist emphasis on law and order, the rigid anti corruption posture, and the self absolutary tendency of populist politicians, whose primary message is to blame past politicians for the pitfall or their political answer. Now, how to square these two pictures of populism as targeting the judiciary power as the primary guarantor of the rule of law with this other kind of populism, which is uh, vigilant, moralistic, and which relies on judge to purge society from immoral elements? One easy answer would be that uh, populists target constitutional courts while they side with 
civil and most often criminal judges. But obviously this answer is too simplistic and it doesn't really explain the core, what is the attitude of populism towards judicial independence. So let me, let me make a step backward. What is populism? We could define populism either in some kind of institutional terms. So for the institutional proposal, they usually carry on, uh, especially at the constitutional level, or um, using ideological terms. And I believe that populism can be better grasped, uh, grasped in this second way, as an ideology, much more than as uh, a set of constitutional reforms. Why I say that? Because populists may advance two opposite kinds of constitutional reforms, which reflect the two sides of populism. The one which likes politics and majoritarianism, the one which the other which dislikes politics. And let me be more clear. Some kind of constitutional reforms usually strengthen populist power, executive power of the parliamentary, usually threaten the judiciary power through political appointment, etc. However, there is another kind of reforms which, for instance, has characterized the Italian constitutional scene, where um, populists have proposed and succeeded, unfortunately, first to drastic, drastically cut the number of the parliament, and the main argument was that the members of the parliament cost too much. And um, uh, they proposed, but formally they have, have not succeeded yet, to eliminate the prohibition of imperative mandate. And then this had, had been done before because populism is running into the Italian political system since a long time. Um, proposed to eliminate, they succeeded in eliminating immunities and parliamentary authorization to prosecute members of the parliament. Um, uh, and other kind of um, strange proposals, such as uh, sortition as a method of selection of parliamentary etc. Now, let's go to the ideological definition of populism, which I think is more promising. So, um, from an ideological point of view, um, I will um, basically steal and rely on what Boyan um, Gugaric said yesterday. I completely agree that uh, Populism is characterized by anti-elitism and by people-centrism, which is a little different than anti-pluralism. However, these two um, sets of ideology can be um, declined in different terms. Uh, anti-elitism may be just the wish of a circulation of elite, more alternation of power, or maybe a more radical claim that all elites need to be neutralized, and this may lead to the anti-political stance in, in populism. Also, po po people centrism it can expose or be um, favorable uh, with an agonistic view of politics, um, uh, where some uh, uh, constitutional issues are again put into the political arena especially social rights, but it may have another aspect, more sinister, where the people is seen as advancing post-ideological claims, that's a typical populist language, which are claims that anybody would share, this is the claim, if they simply were not influenced by factionalism. So in its radical version, Populism is an ideology which aims at purging society from the corrupting influence of factionalism. Now, if populism is an ideology, it can be carried out by any power, not just the political power. Um, uh, I, will immediate, I will soon tell how this can happen, but first I would like to spend a few words on the attitude of this kind of radical populism vis-a-vis the principle of separation of powers. Radical populists are suspicious towards the principle of separation of power, but they do not use the classical authoritarian argument, for instance, the one uh, held by Thomas Hobbes, that the separation of, pa of power may um, hinder uh, the power of the government or may uh, expose society to chaos. Not at all. The usual 
they use some kind of constitutional language. They claim that powers are in fact not separate, so that the system of checks and balances is doomed per se. And uh, this kind of claim could be um, carried out in two opposite ways. Uh, one way is that to claim that judges collude with elites. So the idea of judicial independence is fake. Um, and uh, this is why, uh, uh, yes, they propose some kind of policies to unconventional to counterbalance the elitist tendencies in judiciary power. That's what I say. Or it can happen the opposite. Um, it's the judiciary which sees that the, polit the political system has built too strong systematic um, alliances with other kind of elite, most typically corporate elite or even criminal elite. No? Now, uh, let me mention very uh, fast what is penal populism. You know, populism has been defined in two opposite ways, not two opposite, but two distinct ways. One where um, populist, uh, po uh, you know, populism is the um, populist punitiveness, meaning the populist use of criminal justice promoted by government and populist political forces, mainly for demagogic reasons. Or there is another way where the uh, um, penal populism is defined as the use of criminal law made predominantly by judges to pursue populist political objectives. For instance, this is the idea of um, a very um, important Italian criminal law scholar, uh, which is named Giovanni Fiandata, who identifies penal populism with, with judiciary populism, and he describes it as the attitude of judges to make direct appeal to public opinion in order to pursue the populist wish to purge society from immoral and contaminating elements. Um, obviously, political power can pander judicial populism. The Italian case, for instance, is full of uh, laws which were enacted to <laughs> ponder this idea of uh, these moralistic stances. I can just mention a few. For instance, uh, um, uh, penalties against uh, corruption, which is a very bad thing, but they are very um, much enhanced. And the, the, the law was called crush the corrupt, spazza corrotti. Uh, the extensive use of spine Trojan virus has been uh, um, allowed for wiretapping. Um, uh, criminal trials to be commenced on the basis of anonymous reports and things like that. A lot of laws which I mean, can be squared. Now, um, how does, uh, how can judge act as a populist force? Um, the typical argument that uh, judges can be involved in the political battle, but I don't think it's the correct answer. Um, because uh, to be populist, judges need to do something more. They to make a call, and they often do, we have a lot of uh, decisions, court decisions like that, to public opinion to side with them against the system. I need the support of the public opinion to combat the system. Or judges radicalizing anti-elitist stance, uh, stances for overemphasizing the tendency of political elites to build alliances with other kind of elites. And we have a lot of court decisions who speak of systemic alliances, systemic um, collusion among elite powers. Uh, now, this is the radical version. Obviously, we can have a soft anti elitism which, is, which could be valued. For instance, yesterday, uh, Bojan mentioned uh, the um, uh, anti oligarchic constitution of fish in Amphorbath. But when is too much? When anti elitism? is not appropriate anymore. Now, um, uh, just I'm going very fast towards the conclusion. Uh, the thing I want to um, stress at a conceptual level is that there are basically two ways to capture populism. The first one is to see populism as a backlash, as the reaction to an excessive judicialization of politics. The second way is to see populism not as a backlash, but as the radicalization of that trend of the judicialization of politics, where anti-elitism is basically used 
as a tool against factional politics, what is defined as factional politics. Um, for instance, Piero Samballon said that sometimes um, he defines populism as the quintessential anti-politics, and he says that legalism is used as a political strategy. Now, in this second view, populism claims neutrality. So next to a sort of voluntaristic populism, which may be nativist or democratic or leftist, etc., we have to account for another form or maybe another aspect of populism, where the main utopia is a society purged by the contaminating influences originating from factionalism. Here, moralism and punitives are punitiveness are central features. Um, uh, if this imagine is correct, we shall not be surprised that also the judiciary and not solely the populist political parties may claim the investiture to carry on the populist battle. While populist political actors may in the end be charged with the allegation of replacing all the elites with a new one, especially when they reach a governmental position, combating elites from the judiciary bench may give rise to the illusions of a neutral force and neutral judiciary power fulfilling the two populist utopias of an elitless and a victimless society. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lucia, very much. That was a, a most clear, uh, clearly articulated uh, argument. Um, I, I think we have the opportunity later on to discuss um, more on it. Um, I quickly, uh, we quickly proceed with uh, Fausto Vecchio, uh, professor of comparative public law, also from the Core uh, University of Enna and also a member of the Popcorn uh, Network. Uh, Fausto. Uh, you need to open your micro, Fausto. Okay, sorry. <sighs> Thank you, thank you, Akritas. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank you uh, and the Popcorn Network group for this uh, invitation, because for me, it's a great uh, honor uh, to take part uh, at, uh, uh, at, uh, this, uh, at this webinar. And uh, uh, in, uh, I, I, I feel lucky to speak uh, after uh, uh, Professor Costas, uh, Dozinas, and uh, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Lucia Corso, because uh, I, I really agree uh, with, uh, uh, with their uh, position. In my speech, I have to deal with uh, the topic populism and the judiciary. And, but before to face it, I need to itemize some, uh, some premises. Mm, I, I need to itemize four premises. My first premise concerns the subject uh, because it's an enormous subject. And of course I have to circumscribe it. So I will focus on a very specific topic I will speak ab about only about the constitutional short circuits produced by public prosecution service in uh, uh, in Italy. But uh, notwithstanding this uh, delimitation, I believe it is impossible to afford it in 12 minutes. So all I can do in this time is just to anticipate some salient point of my paper. I have presented, uh, I believe you send it, uh, Akritas, but I have presented uh, 35 uh, paper of argumented uh, position. Uh, I know I have to reduce it for the future, but uh, I, I can refer to, to that. Maybe after we will have some room for a debate. My second premise concern instead a basic assumption I will presuppose 
and I will not demonstrate uh, due to compromise in the constitutional framework, the Italian prosecution service has experienced a level of independence unknown in other constitutional democracy. I will not demonstrate it just because I believe it has been sufficiently uh, underlined by a lot of Italian and foreign, uh, and foreign scholars, but of course, uh, if you are interesting, we can debate later. My third premise is instead concerned the assumption I would like to demonstrate a wrong conception, an ideological conception of judicial independence has produced a dangerous and self-referential -refer prosecution service. And my last, uh, and my last premise concerns my conclusion. I strongly believe that to avoid the empowerment of a right-wing political populism, it is mandatory and urgent a reform of the Italian check and balance. After this uh, premise, I would like to start underlining the striking contrast between the praxis of public prosecution service and some basic principle of constitutionalism. Some data set could be useful, some data set and some, uh, and some news from actuality could be useful for a better comprehension of my, of my point. First uh, of all, uh, I want to underline the relevance of the prosecutor's powers in the Italian system. 25 years ago, Ferraioli, not a populist, reported the significant disproportionality between the number of criminal proceedings against public administrators and actual convictions. 85, I remark, 85 convictions from nearly 35,000 cases means less than three per thousand of success. The same data were recently reported by the general prosecutor of the city of Rome. In 2017, 57 conviction out of 7,000 proceedings just against just one crime, abuse of law. I can personally add that uh, in my city, nearly 400 university professors have been under investigation without full legal basis. It means a third part of the whole university, and I believe that's not normal. Secondly, a dangerous praxis emerged also from the data concerning liability of prosecutor. Here, we can assist at a reversal phenomena. In nearly 30 years, we have just seven cases of civil compensation in 30 years. In a period of 80 years, only 100 out of 16,000 of the professional assessment of judge were negative. That means no serious form of civil liability and no serious form of professional liability. I am not worthy also a judge with four episodes of aggression with knife get it. It means he get a promotion. The general prosecutor of Supreme Court archives without trial almost 95% of reports of disciplinary violation. I would like to remember that the general prosecutor of the Supreme Court 
published a circular in which he concludes that it is, it is a necessity to proceed with dismissal of the proceedings in relation to self-advanced activity carried out by the aspirant for promotion. He himself was accused to have done self-advanced activity to get an undue promotion. So the circular, which legality is dupedful, appears a way to acquit himself. No need to observe that using the same methods, the prosecutor who's to uh, prosecute public administrator, a public administrator in the same position would be prosecuted. Criminal liability has been an exception. It is true that in the last time, due to recent scandal, something has, is changing, but in general, uh, criminal liability for prosecutor never worked. And it's really hard to hope that it will work on the future. Also, a judge suspected of mafia in 2011 has had the, the possibility to judge till the last mound when he was discovered with $2 million in a bag and he confessed to this crime. It, it means 10 years. Thirdly, we need to say that this power is characterized by a high level of corruption. In the last few years, newspaper reveals at least a dozen of major scandals involving prosecutors. It is important to underline that due to the so-called, just one of these, the so-called Palamara scandal, seven members of National Judiciary Council, among them the former general prosecutor of the Supreme Court, were forced to resign. Nowadays, it appears clear that other members, and among them the new general prosecutor of the Supreme Court and the vice president of the council, seems to be involved in a second and very relevant scandal. It means that near a half of the members elected by the same judge in the council are suspected. A lot of the most important prosecutor are in the same condition. The last point concern a quickly reflection about grossly violation of fundamental rights directly or indirectly caused by the prosecutor action. There is a clear abuse of pretrial detention. In some years, in front of 40,000 place in prison, we have had a situation in which the Italian prison population is composed by 40,000 condemned prisoners and by 20,000 pretrial prisoners. The situation led to an unacceptable paradox. To avoid the condemnation of the European court, we have to release condemned person with amnesty and we leave in prison person waiting for a trial. While typing praxis present the same kind of problem. So it seems to me possible to say that we have a situation where a corrupted and self-exculpatory power used to work at the border of legality without responsibility and in violation of some basic right and in violation of the same idea of separation of powers. Obviously, this situation is in contrast with many principles of constitutionalism, such as separation of power, accountability in the exercise of power, transparency, respect of fundamental rights, legality, and equality. Of course, those problems were well known by uh, Italian doctrine. Luci Lucia has spoken by the appreciable critics made by 
Giovanni Fiandaca and other important law professor in the last year uh, has denounced this situation. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the majoritarian doctrine used to justify this praxis as a necessary cause. And uh, they used to justify uh, this praxis with the idea of independence of judge in constitutional state. They used to refuse each kind of reform proposed in the last decades. Also, minor reform. Also, a parliamentary committee to investigate major judicial scandal is considered harmful. I don't believe that this interpretation is correct. Independence of judicial power cannot mean self-referentiality and systematics and the systematic abuse we are discovering in this day. Also, judicial power has to move in the framework of constitutionalism. Otherwise, we will have the paradox of a constitutional state without constitutionalism. I am perfectly conscious of the risk of a reform of the judiciary in the era of Orban and Kaczynski. And I don't hope in a punitive reform. But I would remark that any reform has to comply with constitutionalism and this pluralism attitude. I strongly believe that comparative law could help Italy to uh, find a new way uh, in the um, balance of power. Because as Bojan, Bujar, as Bo, uh, Bojan Bujaric has clearly explained yesterday, if we will not address popular dissatisfaction against a clear reform of dangerous judicial populism, probably we will see in the next future a triumph of the reactive right-wing populism of Matteo Salvini and his Lega. Maybe remembering a true democratic life like Roosevelt, we can say that we have to save the Italian constitution from the prosecutors and the prosecutors from themselves. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Fausto. Uh, these uh, are very, very impressive and very boring uh, data that you have presented us. Um, the third paper uh, in this panel comes from uh, Frusina Gardos Oroz and Zoltan Sente. Uh, dear colleagues, I hope I didn't uh, butcher the pronunciation of your names too badly. Uh, Frusina and Zoltan are professors of constitutional law at the Elte University of Budapest and at the um, National University of Public Service in Budapest, respectively. Um, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, uh, thank you a lot for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, my colleague Zoltan Sente is also here, but uh, we decided that uh, I will uh, use uh, this, this short time in order to be uh, clear and precise on, uh, on our topic. Uh, so, uh, I share the, uh, the slides. Uh, yes, and... Uh... Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, to be seen clearly also um, that um, we both come uh, from the um, Center for Social Sciences um, Institute for uh, for Legal Studies. 
uh, where we, uh, we have an age uh, 2020 uh, research on the uh, varieties of, of populism in Europe, where uh, we are uh, the Center for Social Sciences and the, uh, the Director General is the, the chief um, uh, or principal investigator. Uh, so we are the consortium leaders. And uh, we study uh, populist uh, constitutionalism in the last uh, uh, three years uh, within this framework. And uh, we try to do uh, empirical uh, studies on, uh, on how populist constitutionalism can be traced in the constitutional changes of the uh, European uh, countries. Uh, we investigate the institutional changes, the procedural uh, changes, um, and, and also uh, we, um, we arrived uh, to the investigation of the uh, interpretation uh, policies of the different uh, high courts, uh, especially uh, the constitutional courts. And um, uh, in this presentation, uh, I will uh, share uh, our results uh, uh, only about uh, this aspect of this uh, entire research. So how the constitutional uh, interpretation is influenced uh, by, by populism. And, um, and we also um, um, decided to, uh, to do a, a great research on this topic uh, because uh, with Zoltan, uh, we lead a working group um, on constitutional interpretation uh, in uh, the framework of the uh, International Association of Constitutional Law. So this is why I, I also put uh, uh, this logo on this slide, just, uh, just to make some advertisement also uh, to the work of the this uh, working group on, on constitutional interpretation. And uh, we were uh, invited by uh, the organizers to this conference because this book uh, has just been uh, released by, by Routledge in, um, in the recent months. And this is where we, uh, uh, we uh, summarize uh, our results. Um, um, the problem setting uh, of this book was the uh, was the following. Uh, so we we thought um, that um, uh, the constitutional changes uh, can be very different in the different countries, and um, in many countries uh, the populists or the populist powers are not in the situation uh, to influence um, uh, the constitution making or constitution amending uh, process. In, in some cases, uh, the populist powers, populist parties are not in government or if in government, the constitutional system doesn't allow uh, this kind of, uh, of influence. Um, and, uh, and also in some cases, uh, we just need to um, need to detect the reactions uh, in, um, in the changing uh, constitutional system to the, to the populist uh, uh, claims. And, uh, and we thought that it, it might be problematic if we only uh, examine uh, the uh, constitutional uh, institutional changes in the positive law, law in, in, the, in the written uh, text as, as lawyers. Uh, but uh, we thought that, uh, that the constitutional interpretation is also um, such a field of, of study uh, that could uh, help us to understand uh, this phenomenon. Uh, so how the populism and populist uh, claims uh, influence the the constitutional interpretation. And, uh, and uh, um, first of all, uh, we had to gain some knowledge about, uh, about populism uh, and, and populist uh, claims uh, themselves. And, uh, and uh, therefore, when we studied the, uh, the 10 uh, countries we, uh, we chose in order to find out um, uh, more information about the constitutional changes. Uh, we tried to uh, group these uh, countries um, into two, two groups. Um, we dealt with countries uh, with uh, populists uh, in government 
And uh, uh, we dealt with uh, countries. I will also show you the uh, the countries uh, themselves in a uh, in another sl uh, slide. So we will uh, and we group them into two categories. And in the or during the last day, we we talked a lot about. Um, how how populism in, in is present in the different countries and we also saw uh, that uh, this presence uh, can be can be divided into different uh, periods because there uh, there are some uh, some periods let's say in the last 10 years we investigated the research in the last last 10 years where uh, the populists were in government for a while and then were out of government for a while and and there were countries uh, such as um, Hungary, when uh, when the populist uh, government was uh, had a ruling or even constitution making majority in the last ten years, uh, so we had to face the the fact as a preliminary investigation that uh, that the influence of. Uh, populism, the political influ influence of populism is very different in space and also in time in the, in the different um, uh, countries. And uh, as we, um, as we involved um, into the, into the research, um, also uh, scholars uh, uh, from the from the United States, uh, because uh, Mark Graber and uh, and Mark Tashnet also uh, wrote uh, chapters to this uh, book, and uh, Pablo Ribeiro also from Lat Latin America, um, uh, because uh, we had a conference some um, two two or three years ago at the beginning of this research when we when we faced uh, uh, those. Um, uh, those tensions that we were talking about also during this uh, conference um, um, so far a lot that that actually the uh, the approach um, uh, the overseas uh, approach on populism is fundamentally different than than the European uh, one and uh, and we thought that uh, that we uh, must deal with with this uh, problem and uh, we must uh, uh, differentiate um, the the different um, um, approaches to uh, to populism and uh, and see that uh, uh, that certain phenomenon can be uh, or must be interpreted very uh, very differently in these uh, countries and uh, uh, this is this is pointed out um, in the in the chapter written by uh, by Martin Laughlin uh, very well in the uh, in the book. Uh, so after uh, we uh, we try to find out how uh, the constitutional how, how populism is different in the different countries in the different times, uh, we asked our um, our main question: if uh, this phenomenon that we examine can influence the constitutional interpretation, because. Uh, the um, the meaning of the constitutional text uh, will be uh, defined uh, by constitutional interpretation. We can uh, understand, as we all uh, know, very different uh, things uh, on separation of powers, on on the right to uh, assembly, on on freedom of expression, uh, and and the question is if uh, the understanding of these uh, different constitutional concepts uh, changed, and uh, uh, the question is if if anything uh, has changed on the conceptual uh, level. Uh, this is changed because of the different uh, or uh, new methods of of interpretation, uh, or uh, or it is caused by uh, by some other phenomenon. Uh, so actually. Um, uh, the main uh, the main uh, uh, question uh, that we that we posed uh, to our authors is to find out if uh, in the jurisprudence of the constitutional court or or other high court uh, conducting constitutional um, uh, review has changed in the uh, in the last ten years uh, under the pressure of of uh, populism in government or outside government, and the question uh, was or our um, our um, 
requirement was to collect those cases uh, where the jurisprudence uh, uh, changed and um, and uh, introduced a new concept or introduced new methods of uh, interpretation. And uh, as a result, uh, we we have found uh, that there were uh, several countries uh, where the constitutional court uh, did not change um, uh, their method of interpretation, uh, meaning that uh, uh, it used um, further uh, the proportionality uh, test, uh, the necessity examination, uh, the examination of, of legitimate uh, legislative uh, goals. Um, it did not really uh, change the um, the methodology of, of how to get to the meaning of the constitutional um, test. Uh, while in uh, text, while in other cases, uh, we found out uh, that there were uh, changing interpretative uh, practice, um, and. Uh, and when we found that there were changing interpretative uh, practice, uh, we grouped uh, these changes into two categories. One, when it promoted uh, the, uh, uh, the populist aspirations, and in the other case, uh, when, uh, when it uh, uh, tried to uh, counteract uh, the populist uh, uh, aspirations. And uh, when we created uh, these, uh, these groups in, um, in our uh, book, uh, then we uh, try, try to find out um, what kind of um, uh, judicial strategies uh, led to uh, one or the uh, other solution. And also we, uh, we try to find out if uh, there is um, a specific uh, method of interpretation, or if there are specific concepts uh, of, uh, of uh, interpretation that, that help uh, uh, the populist aspirations uh, to be elaborated on, on a constitutional uh, level. And uh, although uh, Mark Tashnet uh, warned us uh, in his uh, theoretical uh, introductory paper that uh, we might not find autochthonous uh, um, um, constitutional uh, interpretation uh, for populism, uh, because um, the different uh, constitutional settings are so much different. And I think this is what, uh, what Boyan Bukaric also uh, 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 also emphasized in his introductory uh, speech on, on his book together with Mark Tashnet. So Mark Tashnet was, uh, was very uh, uh, straightforward in saying also in our project that, that he believes that, uh, that uh, there, might be, uh, there might not be a, a specific set of uh, methods or a specific set of concepts that help uh, the populist to get the interpretation, to get that interpretation of the constitution that is favorable for them. Uh, but of course, um, uh, although this was um, our, our uh, presumption or starting point, we wanted to prove if, if this, is, this is true. And, uh, and indeed, when uh, we examined uh, the jurisprudence of these countries uh, by the help of the uh, well-acknowledged uh, um, a, a specialist of the national uh, jurisprudences, uh, we, uh, we concluded actually um, uh, in line with, uh, with the presumption of Mark Tashnet that although we could uh, create uh, uh, groups and although we can identify uh, certain um, uh, methods or certain concepts that are uh, specifically or in one case or in another uh, is used in order to um, uh, help uh, the, the populist aspirations. Uh, the circumstances uh, are, are so much different in, in these cases uh, that uh, we cannot really uh, do um, a description of how constitutional uh, populism um, is traced in the interpretation policy of, of the courts. Um, 
so we concluded uh, that um, uh, as uh, as actually uh, the Graeber, Levinson, uh, and uh, and the Tashnet uh, book um, uh, emphasizes that there there is no uh, specific theory of of populist constitutionalism on a theoretical level. Uh, we just went to the empirical study of constitutional interpretation, and we uh, we experienced that. Uh, that there is no uh, specific interpretative uh, method or specific interpretative uh, concept uh, uh, to, um, uh, to describe uh, the, the constitutional populism in, in interpretation. Uh, because just to tell you one, uh, uh, one example, maybe the, ma uh, the, the most uh, uh, fashionable, uh, the constitutional identity, uh, this is this is a, a new concept in constitutional interpretation, as we saw uh, when examining these ten countries present almost every everywhere. But uh, but on the other hand, it's it's very clearly um, uh, seen that uh, in one uh, case it's uh, for um, uh, the populist aspirations uh, and uh, and like in Greece. Um, in, in the other case, like in Croatia, it's just the opposite. It's 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 to um, uh, to step um, uh, against the uh, the populist uh, uh, aspirations. Uh, so um, in sum, uh, we uh, we concluded uh, that as as there might be no specific theory on constitutional interpretation uh, on constitutional uh, populism. It's, it's also true that we cannot uh, trace a, a specific uh, theory of constitutional interpretation and specific methods and, and concepts uh, um, in, in uh, uh, populist uh, constitutionalism. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, uh, Forsina. That was a very original uh, question that you researched and we are um, we are eager to uh, to read your uh, research findings in your volume. Um, well, next is Dr. Uh, Jan Petrov, a fellow at the Masaryk University School of Law in the Czech uh, Republic. Uh, Jan. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just start sharing my presentation. Good. I hope it works now. Um, so first of all, let me thank to the uh, organizers for convening such an amazing event. And it is my honor to be a part of it and present my paper on uh, populism and dejudicialization of politics. And um, I focus on the court curbing measures um, adopted by populist governments in East Central Europe, particularly in, uh, in Poland and in Hungary. So let me start with a caveat that um, when speaking um, about populism in this presentation, um, I have in mind uh, the authoritarian populism from among the varieties that we discussed yesterday. Uh, so I'll focus on authoritarian populism in the terminology of Bojan Bugaric or the populist constitutionalism type one in yesterday's terminology of, um, of Paul Blocker. Um, and I look at these events from a very particular viewpoint, um, from the viewpoint of um, theories of judicialization of politics, because I consider uh, this um, umbrella term, umbrella theory of judicialization of politics as a dominant one in the law and politics scholarship in the past three decades approximately. Um, and, and the mainstream theories of judicialization um, have been usually construed as uh, linear narratives of uh, continuing and intensifying uh, judicialization. Uh, however, uh, the recent populist search uh, with its emphasis on repoliticization and uh, resentment against, um, against technocratization, uh, I argue, brings about a dialectical dynamic to the, to the judicialization um, story. So therefore, the aim of my paper is to revisit the judicialization theories um, and provide a conceptual toolkit that will allow us to analyze the relationship between the actual uh, populist rule and the judicialized structure of governance. And uh, 
by the term judicialized structure of governance, I, um, I built on Alex Stone Sweet's work who argues uh, that basically before the introduction of constitutional courts, uh, legislative politics took place largely in a dyadic structure. So there was the government, there was the opposition, and uh, their disputes were resolved based on uh, means of political negotiation and bargaining. Uh, but the establishment of constitutional courts um, empowered to review the constitutionality of legislation largely shifted uh, the uh, parliamentary lawmaking structure uh, to a triadic one. Uh, where the political means of um, dispute resolution between the government and opposition uh, are complemented or sometimes replaced by, um, by the legal means uh, and by the constitutional court's activities. And uh, this shift towards the triadic structure has a number of reper repercussions for parliamentary lawmaking. And first of all, most importantly, it imposes uh, substantive constraints on, uh, on the governmental majority. And uh, especially in certain countries, it uh, contributes to depoliticization of uh, certain constitutionalized policy spheres. And uh, of course, from the viewpoint of the populist ideology, uh, such effects are in uh, stark contrast with the basic tenets of, um, of populism uh, as an ideology which famously dis distinguishes between the pure people and the corrupt elite. And its main point is um, to authentically enforce um, the will of the real people without the eventual deformations stemming from, um, um, from um, the practices of uh, checks and balances uh, institutions. Uh, so, from this uh, purely ideational perspective, we might expect uh, populist governments to strive for de-judicialization. But uh, when we look um, in practice, um, as I said, I particularly focus on Hungary and Poland, uh, we can see a much more diverse and much more complex, um, complex reality. And I will not retell the Hungarian and uh, Polish stories here because I think they're well known, especially to the learned audience of, uh, of this conference, but rather I would like to present a certain um, analytical model based on, um, on these two countries. And it's of course uh, simplified to some extent as any analytical model, but uh, my starting point is that um, actually what we can see uh, looking at the practice of uh, the two populist governments is a combination of various uh, short and long-term uh, court curbing strategies aiming in some stages for dejudicialization uh, and in other stages uh, for judicialization, but accompanied by um, extreme politicization of, uh, of the constitutional court. Uh, so in the initial stage, uh, we have a new uh, populist government uh, whose aim is to adopt reforms necessary for the consolidation of the populist regime. And the government is likely to um, face an ideologically distant constitutional, uh, constitutional court. And uh, here, both in Hungary and Poland, uh, we could have seen uh, attempts at the judicialization. Uh, and I distinguish between what I call hard and provisional dejudicialization strategies. So the hard dejudicialization strategies are those such as jurisdiction stripping and access restriction or extensive practices of constitutional override of uh, constitutional courts uh, case law. These uh, were quite often, um, or these were used in, in, uh, in Hungary as the, the Orban government um, after 2010, I had a constitutional majority in the parliament. Since many of the hardy judicialization strategies require a constitutional majority, uh, the, the Polish uh, uh, peace government uh, did not have and does not have a constitutional majority, yet it managed to achieve some kind of a provisional dejudicialization for a certain period of time 
uh, using uh, legislative amendments. Uh, so basically combining a number of uh, amendments of the act on the constitutional tribunal, uh, which basically led to a certain paralysis of the tribunal, uh, which uh, for some time was not really able to interfere in legislative politics in, in the real time and in an effective way. But it's largely impossible to hold court and paralysis forever. And uh, the hard judicialization strategies are usually rather limited because they are uh, very costly from the viewpoint of the international reputation of the given country. Um, and therefore, there comes the second, um, second stage where um, the populist governments uh, aim to absorb the um, veto status of the constitutional courts and where they target judicial autonomy through uh, politicization of the bench. And the, we know the techniques quite well from, from history. There might be attempts to replace the incumbent judges with uh, new, um, new loyal judges or attempts to peg the court, increase its size or to combine um, these two strategies. So here on the slide is a, is a simple spatial model, a hypothetical scenario where uh, we have in the initial stage a nine-member constitutional court, and we can see that the median judge is ideologically quite distant from the new populist government. Uh, but then the government manages to replace four incumbent judges um, with, uh, with new ones and uh, increase the size of the court from nine to 15. And, and you can see that if they manage to install um, loyal judges uh, more ideologically inclined to the populist government, uh, the shift of the of the ideological position of the median judge is um, considerably closer to the government's uh, position. Uh, now, th the third stage is mostly hypothetical and it theorizes about what happens once uh, the populist, the, the government of the authoritarian populists uh, starts uh, losing the power. Uh, it has not happened yet in East Central Europe, but we have some um, ideas uh, thanks to the scholarship focusing on Latin America. And there are two, um, two different theories. One saying that, the, uh, that even the new judges uh, will aim to strategically defect. Another theory says that uh, they will try to protect the interests of the, um, of the populist leaders, uh, even when fa facing their uh, loss of power. But uh, let me get back to the, uh, to the main question of my paper, um, and that is what all these strategies do with the uh, structure of uh, governance. And uh, the dejudicialization uh, techniques effect is uh, at least a partial return to the, to the dyadic structure. So basically, if the court uh, is not activated because its uh, access was restricted, uh, or if the court's uh, jurisdiction was uh, was stripped, therefore it has no, uh, not really any um, effective way how to interfere into legislative politics. We uh, somewhat return back to the to the to the dyadic structure, at least for a certain time, at least in certain legal areas. So, for instance, in Hungary, the government um, adopted an amendment which. Uh, strips the constitutional court of the power to uh, review financial or tax laws and to perform a substantive review of constitutional amendments. So in these two, uh, two areas, the, um, the structure of lawmaking largely returns to the, to the dialectic structure. In the second phase of uh, extreme politicization, the triadic structure um, is retained but it is, um, it is uh, reformed as the position of the constitutional court uh, is tilted towards uh, the government where uh, that, that's, the, uh, that's the aim. And we know uh, from the existing scholarship that this might be highly problematic from, for, from the viewpoint of the protection of the rule of law principles of fundamental rights, especially the, the, especially the minority rights. Uh, and but on the contrary, someone might argue that, well, it's necessary to deform the, the triadic structure when it is already deformed in the time zero, when it is tilted towards uh, some other political 
forces. And uh, I can imagine countries where um, this might be right. I can also imagine countries where this argument might be used as a smoke screen for seeking uh, un unlimited uh, power, or at least a power not limited by constitutional courts. Uh, but um, on, on this note, I'd just like to add um, one remark on a long-term uh, danger of these um, deformations of the triadic, uh, of the triadic structure. And um, I call the danger the emergence of the charade triadic structure, because we can see in the original judicialization theories that the constitutional court is conceived as a, uh, as a third impartial and independent uh, actor, somewhat supreme to the um, to the legislative politics, but with the constant tilting of uh, the position of the constitutional court and its composition, uh, there is a danger of inverting the structure where the constitutional court uh, might turn into an inferior actor who, whose position will be swinging according to the preferences of the, um, of the given uh, principle, which I think is uh, highly problematic and dangerous for uh, also the popular demand for judicial independence, which is one of the crucial, um, which is one of the uh, crucial safeguards for judicial independence, because if if uh, if the public sees that basically the constitutional court is just uh, um, just serves the interest of uh, this or that uh, that party, which managed to to pack the court, then of course its reputation and the trust in the court uh, will will tend to decrease. And um, I can see that my 12 minutes are over. I wanted to add a few, few more remarks on how these court curbing measures uh, differ from earlier authoritarian regimes uh, strategies and on the contrary, how they differ from the practices in established democracies. But I think I'll stop here and perhaps if someone is interested, we can get back to it in the discussion. So. Uh, for now, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan. That was most interesting. Um, indeed, we, we, we will uh, have the opportunity to discuss upon it uh, later on. And uh, now last uh, but not least, um, our very own uh, Dimitris Patsikas, PhD candidate in constitutional law at uh, our uh, university law school. Uh, Dimitri. Uh, thank you, Akretas. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, both uh, for hosting this extremely interesting uh, conference and generally for, the, uh, for your ongoing research uh, project on populist constitutionalism. Um, please let me uh, share my uh, screen. I hope that it works properly. First of all, um, I want to admit that I'm far from being uh, an expert on uh, populist constitutionalism. Uh, my research is focused on judicial review of legislation, particularly as it is exercised uh, by the Greek Council of State. So uh, I tried to discover a connection uh, between these two areas. I wonder especially if the jurisprudence of this court uh, somehow contributes to the promotion of populist constitutionalism. This question uh, appears at first sight to be an oxymoron. Um, since populists uh, have a critical stance uh, towards uh, the juridification or judicialization, as uh, Dr. Petrov uh, has uh, mentioned already. Uh, one uh, of the principal demands of uh, the, uh, the populists is that the uh, understanding constitution uh, should not only concern judicial and uh, legal elites, but it, uh, on the contrary, that uh, each and every one of us uh, must get involved with the constitution. Therefore, I'm going to explore a specific aspect uh, of constitutional uh, case law uh, that I believe can actually be related uh, to the enhancement uh, of uh, popular involvement and uh, even encourage people to assert uh, their constitutional rights. I'm talking about uh, the way the Greek Council of State tends to interpret uh, the legal criteria 
for the rules of standing on uh, public interest cases. In the beginning, uh, my attention was to briefly explain why have I chosen uh, the jurisprudence of the Council of State in order to argue in, uh, on this issue. And I have to say that uh, when I'm referring to the court uh, from now on, I will always mean the Greek Council of State. Uh, as you can see, I pinpoint in my slide uh, three milestones uh, for the privileged position of this court uh, within the Greek uh, judicial system. But in order to, uh, to respect uh, the time limit, I will just uh, uh, note two crucial things about the model of judicial review uh, in Greece. First, uh, that the judicial review uh, of legislation is not concentrated in a constitutional court. And second, that the Greek uh, constitutionalism uh, and therefore the constitutional review uh, is strongly related to the jurisprudence of the Council of State. Nowadays, uh, the most important uh, legislative and administrative measures uh, are contested uh, for their constitutionality, uh, ratione materia, uh, before this court. So we need to remember that uh, the major part of the constitutional review has been progressively uh, transferred to the Council of State. Now, I'll go straight on and say a few words about standing or local standing which is one of the major uh, procedural hurdles in order to gain access to courts. I wouldn't like to bother you with uh, many details about the general notion of standing. We just need to keep in mind that uh, with regard to the petition uh, for annulment before the Council of State, uh, the, uh, the contested measure must have caused material or non-material damage to the applicant, while a special bond has to be established between uh, the contested uh, measure and the applicant. Also, in order to be recognized as such, a local standing must be personal in the sense that um, it must relate to that special bond between the applicant and the contested act. It has to be direct, meaning that it must be directly linked to the applicant and not a, another third person. And it has to be present both at the time of the issuing of the contested act and at the time of the filing of the petition. And finally, at the time of the hearing before the court. On the basis of these uh, complicated requirements, we can argue, we can reasonably argue that um, standing as seen from the applicant's perspective is uh, perhaps the most difficult obstacle to the exercise of uh, the right of judicial protection. By contrast, uh, intends to be a powerful weapon in the court's arsenal uh, as seen from its perspective, uh, since it allows uh, the court sometimes to block applicants uh, while other times to open the way uh, for the substantive examination of the case. This implies that in the quite frequent occasions uh, when a question of constitutionality arises, the court has an extremely useful tool at its disposal that enables it to refrain from constitutional review. That is the, uh, the strict implementation of the standing rules. However, the jurisprudential reality seems uh, lately to be moving towards uh, the exact opposite direction. Through an overview of uh, some crucial judgments uh, which were issued over the last decade, we find that the Council of State uh, tends to interpret uh, the legal criteria uh, for standing with uh, sufficient flexibility, particularly when hearing cases of major importance and uh, namely when constitutional issues are raised. I think this tendency is related uh, to the legislative enhancement of the court's powers. I mean that uh, the Council of State seems to uh, perceive, increasingly perceive itself as the informal constitutional court within the Greek legal system. Thus, is not keen to abolish this uh, very role by rejecting uh, applications on purely uh, procedural grounds. In this context, uh, it avoids applying a formalistic approach uh, on the admissibility rules and prefers instead to treat them with distinctive uh, leniency. I intend to explore this trend uh, by mentioning specific decisions with uh, substantial public interest, which are divided into two broad categories. First of all, I will refer to cases triggered by natural persons who claim that some of their constitutional rights uh, have been violated. Well, in judicial practice, uh, we know that there are often doubts over the establishment of the standing requirements. So in marginal cases, it is up to the court to decide uh, whether these rules will be strictly applied 
with the application being declared as inadmissible, or uh, they will be handled in a rather vague manner with the court proceeding to the substance of the case. Irrespective of the outcome of, of constitutional review, which is, uh, is not at issue here, and uh, this is why I do not make any comments uh, about it, we will realize that the Council of State uh, adopts a lenient treatment of the party standing rules. For instance, it has been held that a motorcyclist fulfills standing requirements to contest the administrative measure about traffic restrictions um, introduced in Central Athens, a project called the Grand Walk. The court boldly ruled that the applicant, who is merely a resident of the Greek capital and holds a motorcycle license, has lawful right to question the contested measure, since, I quote, it discourages the use of motorcycles, which would instead lead to saving space and decongesting city, city center, end of quote. A broad conception of the standing rules is also uh, detected in environmental case law. It was recognized that residents of a wider area have uh, interest to challenge the regulatory acts uh, that set the framework for the regularization of illegal buildings, the notoriously called planning amnesty. The court stated that the adoption of these acts, the scope of which uh, covers the whole Greek territory, was expected to provide uh, the legal basis for the issuance of individual administrative uh, acts about illegal buildings uh, residing, uh, situated near uh, the applicant's residences. The only thing relied on by the applicants was the potential damage that might have been caused, I quote, to the residential environment of their area, the quality of their personal everyday lives and the society as a whole, end of quote. The court considered their interest sufficient enough and thus managed to give a definitive ruling on the constitutionality of the contested laws. Using similar reasoning, the court has found that property owners residing near the Acropolis area have standing to break proceedings against the construction of a multi-story hotel in the same area, because this would result in a major decline in cultural and residential environment. In this case, the court required nothing but the party's proximity to the disputed uh, real estate project. Another aspect of the case law uh, seems quite um, impressive, uh, I could say even shocking. I'm referring to the extremely tolerant attitude demonstrated from the Council of State towards remedies submitted personally by the head of Holy Metropolis against the public school courses on religious education. It has been held that the uh, Metropolitan Bishop has indeed the right to appeal against changes in the content of teaching religious lessons in schools. It was accepted by the court that, I quote, he bears separating responsibilities for the Orthodox Christians of his metropolis who are morally affected, end of quote, by the amendments on their religious uh, education classes. What I would like to point out here is that in these decisions, uh, local standing has already been granted uh, to other applicants, uh, such as uh, students, parents, and theologians. So the court would in any case uh, address the substance of the, these matters, even if bishops' applications were dismissed due to lack of standing. On this account, the fact uh, that the court didn't deny that the bishop uh, justifies uh, personal interest to participate in these cases is a strong indication of its flexible approach to the procedural rules. In all these cases, it was not quite clear that the parties were directly affected by the contested tax. However, the court abstained from the strict enforcement of the standing rules and was enabled to express its views uh, on constitutional grounds. Now I'll come to the second category of judgments uh, that refer to the frequent participation of legal persons before the Council of State. It is true that the largest part of the recent constitutional litigation comes from the infamous uh, memoranda and resulted from unions or associations representing groups of affected persons. Especially in one of the most well-known cases, uh, the court sitting in full plenary has reviewed the constitutionality of the first memorandum. Among the dozens of parties were trade unions of civil servants, pensioners, and employees in the private sector, as well as uh, professional bodies of lawyers, engineers, and traders. It has been held that these legal persons uh, have standing to, to bring proceedings, uh, since the austerity policies, such as uh, cuts in salaries and pensions, cause damages to their members' interests. The same happened again in the case concerning measures about, imposed by the second number. 
Also, a petition for annulment of a special property tax imposed on electricity bills was lodged among others by an association called Greek taxpayers. In this case, the Council of State has ruled that this legal person fulfills the standing rules to question the constitutionality of this measure, even though its uh, statute provides in rather general terms that its purpose is, I quote, to safeguard the interests of the Greek taxpayer, end of quote. The wide involvement of legal persons is, uh, in proceedings uh, regarding constitutional uh, review is also uh, noted in cases uh, that are not related to the economic crisis. For example, when the Council of State came, came up with the legislation uh, that granted citizenship to second generation immigrants, it was the Hellenic League for Human Rights, the, the oldest uh, human uh, rights NGO in Greece, uh, which stood up and intervened in support of the constitutionality of the contested law. The NGO's uh, intervention was held admissible, so it had the chance to speak about the constitution before the court. Environmental organizations as well, such as WWF, frequently appear before the court to complain that the legislature or the administration failed to comply with the provisions of the Greek constitution or their duty to protect the environment. The Council of State acknowledges that these persons justify legal interest to contest administrative acts related to any human intervention on the environment occurring anywhere in Greece. Well, these uh, findings help me to elaborate on this judicial trend, starting from the main looming Greece, that is, the potential conversion of the petition for annulment into an Acto Popularis. Briefly, we define Acto Popularis as uh, the action brought by one or more members of the public in order to defend general interest. The court itself identifies this danger. In the decisions that I, I previously discussed, uh, some of the judges supported the opinion that the remedies should be dismissed due to lack of uh, local standing. Especially in the decision about the, the first memorandum, it was ruled that the collective bodies, professional and trade unions have no standing to challenge the individual administrative acts concerning their members separately. If this application had been declared admissible, it would lead to the introduction of an Acto Popularis, I quote, which is alien to the institution of the petition for annulment within the Greek legal order, since its purpose is not to redress the implementation of the applicant's freedoms and rights, but it rather constitutes a manner to express her general concerns about uh, the restoration of legality, end of quote. Likewise, in the decision concerning the special property tax, imposed on electricity bills, 17 judges, including the court president and three vice presidents, dissented and stated that the association called Greek taxpayers has no standing simply because its statute provides that it's entitled to challenge every act contrary to its objectives. Some concerns were also expressed in the decision that examined the planning amnesty. A minority opinion held that merely invoking the status of a resident in a specific area and showing general interest on the residential environment are insufficient to justify uh, standing rules. On that context, we anticipate that the expansion of the concept of standing rules has been the subject of a dynamic debate within the court. Despite though the previously mentioned uh, concerns, uh, the, pre uh, the prevailing tendency within the Council of State is the lenient treatment of the admissibility rules. In this way, the court manages on the one hand uh, not to be accused of excessive uh, judicial self-restraint and on the other hand to decide on the merits of the public interest cases. It seems then that the benefits from applying this trend uh, have been evaluated by the judges as notably more important than the risks. In any case, through this approach, the court has succeeded in emerging as the privileged field for the development of the so-called public interest litigation. Nevertheless, I'm not so much uh, concerned about how the Council of State understands its place within the current uh, legal and constitutional framework. What I want to highlight is the impact of this judicial um, trend on the quality of democracy. In my view, and now I'm proceeding to the conclusion, this trend can actually be associated with the promotion of constitutional discourse, which at present is largely absent from political and social life. Particularly, the broad conception of the admissibility rules acts as a de facto substitute for the lack of political representation. Citizens who have been expelled or at least ignored 
by the key players of decision-making processes, the political parties, uh, the government and the parliament, are encouraged to participate actively in the constitutional dialogue and deploy their arguments on the constitution. From the ordinary residents of the Acropolis area who seek to preserve their view of the monument, to the senior church official who requests to be heard on the manner of teaching religious lessons at school, individuals and interest groups are turning uh, to the Council of State in order to express their views, whether these are legally correct or not. So by adopting a spacious attitude towards the uh, rules of standing, the Council of State does contribute to the promotion of uh, populist constitutionalism, since it offers to people who cannot uh, be shared elsewhere the opportunity to argue about the legislation, the constitution, and in the final analysis uh, about their rights. At least to some extent, the court tends to replace the severe democratic deficits arising from the ongoing decline in the public uh, discourse. In a nutshell, and as I said in the beginning, the leading theory uh, within the field of uh, populist constitutionalism has in principle a negative stance towards the excessive uh, juridification of constitutional matters, since politics and the legislature uh, are still regarded as the traditional battlefields uh, for contesting unpopular public choices. However, what I'd like to demonstrate is that the lenient treatment of the standing rules reminds that the judicial review of legislation still remains an effective and the yet democratic option to fight for a constitutional implementation. This tendency seems to nudge citizens acting by themselves or together with others to petition the court with, uh, for relief uh, while considering that this might be one of their last opportunities to, uh, for their constitutional complaints to be raised in public. Whether this trend is followed uh, by the court with complete awareness or not, intentionally or not, in my opinion, it actually achieves the enhancement of uh, popular involvement. And as a side uh, effect, I think uh, it can contribute to the promotion of populist constitutionalism. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention and uh, waiting for your, your questions and the comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. Um, well, we have a uh, rather limited time for questions. Uh, there is one question uh, written um, uh, on the chat by uh, Gabor Halmai uh, is addressed to Frusina. I read it for everybody. I wonder uh, what working definition of populism your empirical research used while comparing constitutional interpretation of constitutional courts. Um, um, so uh, I see Fotis and uh, Harala Boskurundis uh, asking uh, permission for question. I have to ask you, however, to only uh, pose question and to only um, self-restraint yourself to one minute strictly. Uh, Babi. Thank you very much and thank you all for your uh, presentations. Uh, just one question for uh, Dimitris. Do you think that uh, this is uh, really a general trend of the Council of State? Because I have in mind that, for example, uh, the union of the workers uh, in the water service uh, wanted to, <clears throat> to oppose the privatization and the, and the Council of State said that uh, they couldn't. Uh, while uh, in the case uh, previously also mentioned uh, by another speaker uh, of the uh, religious uh, education in the 660 to 2018 and uh, the next one, uh, 1749 of uh, 2000. Probably too much information. Yes, yes, uh, yes. okay. Uh, it said that uh, uh, not the uh, leader of the Greek Orthodox uh, Church, but uh, of uh, just of Piraeus could stand uh, and finally win uh, the case. Uh, that's uh, my question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fotis. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. So thank you, everybody. Very quick question for Jan. So the Hungary and Polish examples are excellent case notes of uh, case uh, case studies, obviously, currently. 
And you describe this the uh, juridicalization of politics that is combined with the dilution of uh, sort of checks and balances with regards to the independence of the judiciary, right? So I wanted you to sort of uh, try to posit that in a comment that Akritas made yesterday evening, that certain practices might be authoritarian, which is what you are describing effectively, authoritarian critical policies, but they're not necessarily populist or demagogue. So I was wondering how would you sort of describe the situation because the most common sort of element or characteristic of populist uh, reactions is a complete attack against the judiciary. So essentially going against even the existence of the judiciary. Here we have something slightly different. We have the manipulation of the judiciary to fit a particular narrative. Thank you. Thank you for this. Any other questions? Uh, okay, then uh, I, I'm tempting, I'm, I'm being tempted to misuse my, my position as chairperson to pose two very short and very naive questions. The first uh, to Lucia. Um, well, my naive question to Lucia is that, uh, well, aren't judges, aren't the judiciary themselves um, uh, part of the elite? elite, uh, the judicial elite? That's my question. So if we, if we um, treat the judiciary as an elite institution per se, then perhaps we could have a rather differentiated um, approach. My question, my second question goes to uh, Jan and is very similar to what uh, Fotis uh, just now said. Um, is it really that these de-judicialization strategies are a part of the populist um, uh, agenda? I mean, uh, there are de-judicialization de strategies um, that are proposed by people who are not populist or are not designated as populist in the, in the public discourse. I mean, Currently, there is a, well, uh, not, um, not insignificant uh, movement in the United States uh, that um, uh, promotes the idea of either uh, jurisdiction stripping or and court packing uh, the Supreme Court and they um, they, should, they, they think that the, that the Biden admi administration should uh, engage either or both of these uh, mechanisms. So is it really digit judicialization um, inherent to populism? Um, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure whether I see any other questions on the chat. Uh, so I believe these are the questions. Uh, um, each of you may uh, answer. I think it is fair to answer in the order that you have uh, spoken. So uh, Lucia first, um, uh, Fausto then, uh, Frosina, Afterwards, Jan and uh, Dimitris. Uh, Lucia, please. Thank you, Akritas. Um, our judge elite, yes, but uh, the problem is, I don't think is who is the elite and who is the people, but who <clears throat> claim investiture to carry the battle. So even uh, political, uh, populist political actors are elite, <clears throat> but um, the judiciary, at least in a way to see them, may uh, claim this, uh, um, this investiture because of the reason I gave. So I, I don't think the real issue is who is the lead, but who sees how, this is my answer. Thank you, that's uh, exactly what I have expected from you. Uh, so uh, Fausto, is there uh, something you need to say? Probably not. So, uh, Frosina and uh, Zoltan. Zoltan. 
just to uh, destroy even better the, the theory of populist constitutionalism, I would say to this judici judicialization uh, um, a theory that uh, that uh, in Hungary, for example, the judiciary, the the ordinary and the constitutional judiciary as well, is very important for the for the populist uh, government to to help the the populist uh, uh, political uh, goals. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I have already answered in the chat to Gabor Halmai, but uh, for the public public answer, I would pass the floor uh, to my colleague Zoltan Sente. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, dear colleagues. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, really, I, I, I'd like to, to answer Gabor's question, uh, namely that what kind of definition we use for our comparative research, what kind of definition of populism. So basically, I can say that our starting point was that there is no any uh, consensus about the concept of populism, even whether it is a particular political organization, ideology, um, political aspiration, or only simply uh, style or, or rhetoric. In this situation, we, we set out the most cited conceptualizations of populism, um, of political science and constitutional studies, referring to the most widespread ideas. Then, we try to identify the most common features or components of populism as we found them in, in the literature. Then we identified first and second order criteria depending on their frequency or, or, or positive and negative criteria of populism. I mean, positive values on the one side or, or criticism of, of liberal constitutionalism or representative democracy democracy on the other side. However, basically we left it up to our national authors to consider which parties and initiatives they regard as populists, asking them only to justify their choices. But I can say that their choices coincided with the general uh, uh, judgments, for example, Syriza, Podemos, Vox, Truth and Justice, Fides, and, and some others were, uh, others were identified as populist parties, right? Maduro, Trump, Orban, Kaczynski as, as populist politicians. Uh, but finally, I can say that, that among our authors, there were no serious dis disagreements about populism. The same question was raised about populist initiatives, populist issues or policies, but in this regard, I can say the same. Uh, there was no serious disagreement about it. Anti-migrant, Eurosceptic, nativist popular initiatives or constitutional amendments were labeled as populist ones. Um, and I, I believe that the simplest way to check what I'm saying is to, to read the, the un ongoing book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Jan. Yes, uh, many thanks for uh, both questions. So uh, what is asked, and I hope I do not misinterpret um, his question, is basically what is authoritarian about uh, all of that that I presented and what is populist um, about all of that that I um, that I presented. And uh, I think it's an important question because if we look at the, the non-democratic regimes of the 20th century, be it the Nazis, communist military regimes or other authoritarian regimes, they all basically somehow meddled with uh, judicial independence, but uh, all these regimes uh, were openly anti-democratic and often um, built on, on, on violence. Uh, whereas, uh, the, the populist court curbing, I, uh, I, I don't think that the court curbing techniques are uh, new or, um, or um, particularly uh, populist. They are not. They are uh, quite similar to what we know uh, from history. But I think that the major difference uh, rests in, in framing, in context, and uh, justification that the populist ideology uh, allows for um, for the court curbing steps. So 
the populist court curbing, um, I think, is more subtle and incremental, and rather than using brute force, um, uses legal means. So scholars like uh, David Landau speak about abusive constitutionalism, Paul Blocker speaks about uh, legal instrumentalism. But most importantly, I, I think uh, that populism is based on the democratic vocabulary and, uh, and, and populist imaginary. So uh, you know, mentioning terms like populist sovereignty, uh, popular sovereignty, constituent power, and popular uh, popular will is crucial for for justifying these um, court curbing measures, and it allows the populist parties to present the court curbing uh, or to present judicial independence uh, as a bulwark, allowing elitist judges to deform the genuine will of the people. And of course, in some countries, this might um, this might be the case, as I as I mentioned during the presentation. In other countries, it might be just um, just um, just a smokescreen. And um, Akritas, uh, on the contrary, uh, asks, is it really popul populist? Uh, things like that happen in, in um, other countries uh, too. And uh, um, I also think you're, you're right, the US is a good example and they're the uh, court packing, but not only, but also um, other uh, court curbing strategies have, um, have a long tradition. Uh, so uh, I think we're talking about a certain certain specter, and the line is surely uh, blurred. Uh, but I also think that some degree of uh, of politicization is quite usual, uh, even for established democracies. And some someone might argue that it's even normatively desirable from the viewpoint of the democratic accountability of uh, um, democratic accountability of of the judiciary. But what I think is specific for authoritarian populists, at least those in Poland and Hungary, is, is the scope of the measures, the, the, the sequencing and uh, the unilateral uh, nature. That, and the combination of these, uh, these three aspects, in my opinion, make it uh, cases of extreme politicization rather than, the, um, rather than the regular level. So I hope it uh, answers your questions. Thank you. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Uh, by the way, we have two comments by uh, our um, uh, keynote speakers that are relevant. I quickly read them. Costas Vizinas uh, writes that uh, Duncan Kennedy um, commented that uh, when the Supreme Court acts in a partisan way and constitutional theory cannot change this, uh, perhaps the only way is to pack the court with liberal judges. And he comments that, unfortunately, Trump got there first. And um, Boyan Bugaric um, um, gave us reference to, uh, to a piece he wrote uh, on Verfassungsblock D. Uh, anybody that is interested uh, may find the link on uh, chat. Um, and uh, Bogan uh, wrote why court packing is uh, different uh, in the United States and in uh, Poland. Um, uh, Bogan also, um, also uh, 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 refers to, to, to a passage uh, by Duncan Kennedy's article uh, I, I read it. Uh, these are the words of Duncan Kennedy. When I agree with a frustrated majority and when the consequences of the exercise of judicial review are plausibly very dire, and when the specific court packing plan is sufficiently careful to avoid collateral harm, then I am in favor of a dramatic intervention to save the Republic. Uh, that's the end of the quote. Um, um, okay, these are very interesting comments um, in any case. Uh, the last speaker, uh, Dimitri. Yes, uh, thank you, Haralabos, for your uh, question. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the, that there is actually a trend. Uh, of course, uh, this means uh, that uh, there are a lot of uh, examples uh, of cases where uh, the court adopted a harsh approach uh, to the, towards the standing uh, requirements. But I think this is happening usually 
at the, or in the ordinary cases, not when uh, public uh, interest uh, litigation is at stake. Uh, of course, the, the examples uh, that you mentioned uh, about the privatization of uh, certain public enterprises are um, representative uh, of this uh, harsh approach, but I think this, uh, is, this is an exception. Remember that uh, even at these uh, very cases, uh, Council of State accepted the local standing in, uh, in one decision and even uh, annulled the privatization of the, I think, the water enterprise, the public uh, water enterprises in Athens. So uh, I think uh, there is actually a trend uh, that means the, the court uh, bypasses uh, or uh, overcomes the legal requirements uh, of standing. Uh, in order to proceed to the substance of the case and uh, give a definitive ruling on uh, when constitutional uh, raises, uh, ra uh, issues uh, are raised. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, I thank you all for your presentations. This has been a very uh, diverse um, uh, panel concerning the, 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 the subjects of your papers. However, um, it has been an, an intense uh, panel, and uh, I think the judiciary is always a heated uh, topic of discussion when we talk about uh, populism and constitutionalism. Again, I thank, thank you all. Um, uh, after the short break, we, we continue with the, the, the sixth uh, panel later on this afternoon at... Uh, at uh, 4.30, I believe, uh, Greek uh, or East, East European uh, time. Uh, thank you and goodbye for now.